Good morning. Welcome to worship on the first Sunday of Advent and the beginning of a new church year. Advent is a, comes from a Latin word that means coming, arrival. And it's a time when the church does sort of the opposite of what the rest of the world does this time of year, which is getting busier and busier, um, shopping, preparing. In the church, we take four weeks to breathe in and breathe out and to settle ourselves into this holy space to prepare for what really matters, the coming of Christ into our midst at Christmas. The church feels a little bit different with the, the hopeful color of blue, the color of the night sky, the music is a bit subdued. Every time I hear that Bach piece, though, that David plays on the first Sunday of Advent, it sort of clicks me into place that we are in this holy season together. I know that's one of the hardest pieces probably to play because your feet and your hands are doing totally different things. But I invite you all to rise in body or spirit, those of you who are gathered here in person, those of you who are gathered at home, as we begin this um, season of preparation together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who alone does wonders, who lifts up the lowly, who fills the hungry with good things. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate the mystery of Christ's love, let us confess our sin against God and one another. God of all time, we confess that you can seem far away, even when you promise to be near. In our hurt and fear, we lash out against you, our neighbor, even those we love. Forgive us and come to save us. Let your face shine on us until our tears are dried, our sins are faded, and our hope is restored. For we belong to you, and in your hands, through the love of Jesus, we can be made new. Amen. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and all things are made new. May Almighty God strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Jesus 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Come to give you praise for the strength to live your word. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, and defend us, O God. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe. You call all nations to walk in your light and to seek your ways of justice and peace. For the night is past and the dawn of your coming is near. Bless us as we light the first candle on this wreath. Awaken us from sleep that we may be ready to greet the Lord when he comes and welcome him into our hearts and homes, for he is our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, alert us to the threatening dangers of our sins, and redeem us for your life of justice. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. 
In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. from 1 Thessalonians. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see your face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. The word of the Lord. Lord, your love, and grant us your salvation. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, 
distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and I invite the children who are gathered on their iPads or TVs to come close for a, a, a minute together. So as we talked about in Sunday school today, we're starting a new season of the church year called Advent, which means coming. And how we talked about that the one we're waiting for, for these one, two, three, four Sundays of Advent, we light one candle each week, is Jesus. The story of Jesus at Christmas in the manger with his mother Mary and Joseph and the animals. And it takes time for us to prepare for a really good story like that. And part of what we do when we're waiting is we can encourage one another. We talked about that in Sunday school too. Paul said in that second reading that he prayed day and night for those people at the church in Thessalonica. He thanked God for them and he held them in his heart all the time. And this is a wonderful time of year to do that. In fact, all of us, including the grown-ups, can do that. Because this time of year is especially a time when it helps to know that there are people who remember us. Christmas is a very happy time, a very special time, but it can also be a difficult time for people who have lost someone in the past year, or people who maybe have their, their parents off serving in the military, or people who can't get together still maybe because of the virus, or people who are going through something difficult, like a sickness. This is a time of year when we can hold those people in our hearts before God and pray for them day and night, that they would experience the joy of this season as well. And it means that also we'll be praying for you. We know that a lot of you are preparing to come back to church, having gotten your vaccines. And it's been so long since we've seen you, and we long to see you the same way Paul was longing to see those Thessalonians. He says, I can't wait for God to draw us back together. And we know that that day is coming too. So in the midst of our waiting, we have a sense of hope that something good is coming. That's why the lights get brighter each week around our wreath. We keep adding to the joy and the hope and the expectation. And when that wreath is full, we will know that the very next time we gather together will be for Christmas Eve. And we'll know that it's time to celebrate. So I want you to know during this time of waiting, even though waiting is so hard, even though Christmas is so exciting, and we want it to be here today, that we have this time to prepare, to encourage one another, and to pray for each other so that we can be truly ready to welcome Jesus when he comes. So let us pray. God, we thank you for this season of waiting and preparing so that we don't rush too quickly into the most wonderful thing that you have given us, the gift of your Son. Help us to hold one another in prayer day and night, to encourage one another, 
to help each other remember what this season is truly about in the midst of all of our busyness. Thank you for our children wherever they may be this day. In Jesus' name. There was a book that was recommended reading in seminary for one of our courses on pastoral care and counseling called The Body Never Lies by Alice Miller. It was about the long-lasting effects of childhood trauma and how pain that is suppressed early on instead of being talked about and given the chance to heal, can manifest in various unexpected ways as adults, in physical symptoms or in chronic struggles like anxiety and depression. And while the book focuses on children and their unique circumstances, I think her underlying premise can also apply to adults. Feeling emotional pain of any kind is uncomfortable, after all, and sometimes very scary. And it's as if our brains, in a subconscious effort to protect us, come up with all sorts of ways to help us avoid having to feel it. We tell ourselves stories that excuse or rationalize away what we've experienced and endured. We tell ourselves that we are bad, that we somehow deserved it, that if only we could fix ourselves, everything would be okay. We devote ourselves completely to our work or to some project so that we don't have time to just sit with our feelings. Or when all else fails, we numb those feelings with the substance of our choice. But while the brain may forget, even temporarily, the body remembers. There have been all number of studies on this, but most experts agree that 70 to 93 percent of all communication is nonverbal, that is, body language. And if Alice Miller is right, the body never lies. You could ask me how I'm doing, and I could give you an answer. I could ask you how you're doing, and you could give me an answer. But chances are, no matter what we say with our words, much more will be said with our faces, our hands, and our bodies. And that's why I'm so fascinated with our gospel for this first Sunday in Advent, which play, pays a great deal of attention to just that. What do you feel your body doing when you hear these words? There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. When I hear words like that, which are really just a first century version of what many of us are feeling right now, a world that is changing so fast, a humanity that feels increasingly violent and polarized, a planet where weather patterns are becoming more extreme and threatening to life, I will admit that there are days when my body wants to do this. And I sometimes do. Sometimes I stay in bed a little longer than I should, needing another 15 minutes in my warm cocoon before I resume worrying about everything as I am accustomed to doing. Be on guard, Jesus says, so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. But that's easier said than done, isn't it? 
Dissipation is a tiredness of the heart. And our hearts have grown collectively tired through a lot of this year. We also desperately need a rest. And in a lot of ways, that is precisely what Advent invites us into. The question, though, is what kind of rest shall it be? When we are afraid and run down, when we are carrying the heavy burden of pain, whether it's from many, many years ago or several days ago, when we are just unsure about the future, whether it be our own, our children's, or the planet's, it can feel safer to simply go inward, to escape, to drown the world out for a while. And if that feels like self-care for you, if that feels like the most loving thing your body needs is a nap, then there's nothing wrong with that. Even Jesus went off by himself for a while when life became overwhelming. But when this becomes our permanent posture, like that woman bent over for so many years, perhaps our bodies are telling us that we need something more. Perhaps they are telling us that our longing is deeper than just a temporary escape. Some tinsel and carols and whatever we could stuff into our shopping carts at the Black Friday sales this past weekend. Perhaps they are alerting us to our need for something that can't be manufactured or bought or sent to our doors with Amazon Prime. Perhaps our bent downness is our bodies crying out for meaning, for connection, for a sense that there is more going on in this world than what our eyes can see, more than what we hear on the news each night, more than just what makes us afraid. We are longing for hope, beloved. We are longing for a sign that we aren't alone in this great big universe, that we are known and loved, that all these quote-unquote signs, which seem to point to the end, could actually be pointing towards something else, something like the fulfillment of all our longing breaking into the world. Our beautiful first reading from Jeremiah uses the image of a tree. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, who shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, speaks of the one thing that can strengthen our weary hearts, and that's love. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. But Jesus, his is perhaps the best. After he lays out the truth of the situation, all the things in our world that sound so threatening and make us afraid, he says... Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. You may not feel ready to stand. You may not feel ready to raise your head, and yet you know as well as I that our bodies can easily start to conform to our posture and that we sometimes need someone who loves us to take us by the hand and draw us out from our hiding place and invite us to see the light of day again. Raising your head is not the same thing as pie in the sky thinking, after all. Jesus is not saying, just let God worry about everything and go back to your lives as normal. That would be having your head in the clouds. I think Jesus is saying, raise your head just enough that you can see the world for what it is in all courage and humility and name the things that are not right. Advent is a time of making the crooked straight and the unlevel places smooth. But also raise your heads and look ahead because there is something worth looking forward to. You do not want to miss the new thing God is about to do in the world. You do not want your cynicism or anger or sadness to blind you to the miracle that is about to take place. You won't be awake to see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory to set things right 
with this world, starting with every human heart until God's kingdom of justice, truth, and love comes as fully on earth as it is in heaven. You know, sometimes our bodies can get so stuck that they need what's called body work, a visit to the chiropractor or a deep tissue massage, something to break us out of the contorted pattern that we're so used to being in, to ease the tension we've been carrying, to set our bones and sinews right. I wonder if that isn't what Advent is all about, a deep spiritual tending to the parts of ourselves that need to be heard, felt, and loved so that we can, at the end, stand up and raise our heads. And God uses all the right tools to get us to that place. The gift of time and space, the gift of waiting, of unhurried preparation without an agenda, unlike the consumerist crazy fest happening all around us, the gift of honesty and forgiveness, the gift of light in the darkness, the gift of holy presence, of showing up in real flesh and blood. All of it is here right now, and it is for you. What would it feel like for Jesus to be able to touch you and free you from your burdens? What would it feel like to be able to look at the world and not be consumed with anxiety and fear? What would it feel like to look ahead at the rest of your life with a sense of hope that God was truly with you? I hope to find out along with all of you, and I know that we will. And at the end of all of our preparation, I trust that we will be able to stand or perhaps to kneel and gaze upon our redemption, our Savior, face to face. Amen.
who await the coming Savior, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In this season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. God of presence and peace, strengthen your church around the globe to proclaim the message of your love coming to the world. Open our hearts to recognize your face in all people and in all of creation. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. God of equity and compassion, bring righteousness and goodness to all peoples of the earth. Give a heart of discernment and integrity to leaders in our communities. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. God of comfort and care, be present with those who watch and wait. Come to all who await births, deaths, new unions, new jobs, retirements, healing, and life transitions of every kind. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, Your mercy is great. great. God of promises kept and new dreams awakened, protect your people from destructive storms. We pray for those whose lives have been upended by natural disasters, for the work of Lutheran Disaster Response, Lutheran World Relief, and other relief organizations. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. God of mercy and tenderness, spread the shelter of your peace over the community of Waukesha, Wisconsin, in the wake of the tragedy at their Christmas parade. Tend especially to the children whose little eyes witness such great horror. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. God of the everlasting covenant, bless our Jewish brothers and sisters as they begin their celebrations of Hanukkah, the festival of lights. Be a light in the darkness for all who seek and follow you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, your mercy is great. great. God of companionship and community, we give you thanks for the saints who journeyed with us and now abide in you. Even in distress and uncertainty, make us confident that your promises endure forever. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. great. God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share a sign of peace with each other. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And you may be seated. I said last week that whoever was following um, uh, Nancy and Rob uh, with their stewardship talk was in for a, 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 a tough job, but unfortunately that person is me. <laughs> um, I have never done one of these and we were going to do a whole song and dance where I went off and took off my robes and came back wearing like sweatpants and a regular shirt to sh as I was speaking as a parishioner because I am in fact a member of this congregation. Pastors become members of the congregation they serve when they accept a call so I don't belong to some church back in Indiana or where this is my congregation. Um, and the story of my giving, I guess, begins with Knut Ogren, who many of you know from Camp Calumet. Uh, he's the director of development there. But before he had that job, he worked for the ELCA 
as some kind of plan giving person, getting people to give to the ministry of the wider church. And apparently he had this practice at the time, which maybe he still does, when, when, when new pastors would be ordained, he would invite them out uh, for dinner. And I remember we went to Anthony's Pier 4 Cafe on the water there in Swampscott. And he said, so John, do you tithe? <laughs> I thought, well, that's a very direct question to ask somebody, do you tithe? And knowing Knud, I know that by tithe, he didn't just mean give. He meant the 10%, you know, the biblical tithe. And I said, well, honestly, no, I, I don't. Um, and he said, well, you should. <laughs> I said, well, Knud, I, I mean, I'm just starting out. I student loans, I don't have that much money. And, he said, and I said, I give to, you know, I give to my alma mater. I give to uh, the Lutheran deaconesses. He goes, oh, that's great. You keep doing that. But First Lutheran needs your giving. And I sort of took that to heart and decided that, yes, um, it's something I should do. It started off as sort of on the obligation side of things. You should do this. You should lead by example. You should give because it's the right thing to do. And sometimes we need that kind of urging, right? But as time went on, um, and I felt more a part of the congregation, not just the person that had just been hired, it shifted more to sort of like, you know, when you're part of a family, everybody has things they do for one another. And those things aren't considered like, like if I said to Brienne, I'm going to volunteer to do the dishes tonight, she would laugh at that, right? Because you don't volunteer in your own family. You, everybody has a role. Everybody contributes. And so I saw it as, well, I'm part of this community of faith. I believe in what we're doing. I want to do my part to support. And so it felt less like the obligation and more like, well, this is something that's more like what a responsible person does, right? I, 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 I want to pull my own weight. I want to, um, you know, make sure that I'm doing my part. And that was the case for a while. But now, it, it's really hard to put words to it, but I guess I would say it comes from a place of, of real joy. Um, I've been here, as you know, 13 plus years. And now when I look out, I'm, every one of you has a story attached. How I know you, how you came to be part of this place, how I married you in the freezing cold, <laughs> how I, you know, I looked through my records the other day and I think there's been something like 45 funerals that I've done of people in this congregation, people who used to sit in these pews who were part of the chattering crafters, the various groups. I was at Jan and True's house the other day um, after the surgery, and, and Jari is here today. Jari's 23 years old. She's working for 24 <laughs> years old. She's, you know, working for a church in Toledo doing God's holy work among people who with so little. Laurel just bought her first car. Remember, she used to sit in my lap when I would go over there. And it's like you become part of now it's more than a job and more than just a family. It's like uh, there's this mystical, spiritual connection that, we, that I share with this place. So when I come into this room during the week and I sit there and I, I think of all the, the, the memories and the time we've spent. And, and, and so now when, when I give, it, it really is an obligation or responsibility, although it is those things. It's because I want to give to something that really matters to me, something that is part of my life forever and that I want to see continue and thrive. And so um, it is tied up with everyone who comes here and everyone who God has yet to bring here, but it, it, it comes from a place of, of gratitude and joy. And I feel the most excited about that because you know, then when you're planning your budget, you're deciding what to put in that little blue card, it's not like, oh gosh, what does the church need again asking for money? It's like, oh yeah, these are my people. This is what I get to do this year. And so it, it feels different, it feels good, it feels like I'm invested in this community and what God is doing here. So that's sort of 
how I approach giving, how we approach giving. Um, because I think most of you feel the same way about this place. You have the same memories, the same stories, and the same desire for this congregation to, to thrive. You know, we're going through this rough patch right now, like most congregations are, all congregations. But I think we think we're going to get through it, come through on the other side. We're going to eventually come back. We're going to face all these challenges we're facing. We haven't had a renter for, you know, a year now. That's really hurt our um, sort of bottom line. We have all these repairs. But, you know, that's, that's all over here, right? That has to be done. We're going to do it. But underneath all that, there's what this place really means to us. And it's not the bricks and mortar. It's the people. And that's what can motivate our giving back. So there's my story. And I encourage you to consider yours as you make your pledge this year. Let us continue with our service of Holy Communion. Please rise. Let us pray. God of our waiting and watching, we offer these gifts of our heart and our lives to the service of all your people. Prepare the way before us as we meet you in this simple meal. Through Jesus Christ, our pathway and our peace. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new, in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 in 
creator of the cosmos, breath of heaven, lover of us all. You are our praise, our life, our joy. You are there through desert wanderings and willful murmurings, rebellious running and tears of complaint. You are there when sorrow becomes our daily food. You rescue us from ruin and anoint us with blessing. You are there in stable and temple, in river and hillside, cross and tomb, and even beyond the grave. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Rising sun, soaring spirit, radiant Lord, you are here in shining glory, overcoming death and welcoming us to life. By your spirit, make these humble gifts the body and blood of Jesus, your son. Make us one with you and with each other. Make us strong for each other, that we might share your love with your blessed and broken world fount of mercy, fire of justice, dearest friend. Bind us to you and send us out to seek and serve and sing your praise until you gather us up in glory and bright, unending song. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, Forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. He who was with God in the beginning, is with us in this bread. He of whom the prophet spoke now speaks to us in this cup. Come and receive these holy gifts. In them Christ comes to us, that we might come to God. This morning we are returning to our practice of receiving communion around the altar. So if you remember how that works, the ushers will guide you forward. Uh, we won't crowd it up as much as in the past, but you'll to kneel and receive the bread and the cup in your hands, and then someone will come around with an empty tray to place your cup in after you've received. This is God's table, and all are welcome.
Let us pray. Most high God, you have come among us at this table. By the Spirit's power, form us to be bearers of your word, sharing gifts of mercy and grace with all. Through Jesus Christ, our host and our guest. Amen. Amen. May God direct your ways in peace, make you abound in love for one another and for all, and strengthen your hearts until the coming of our Lord Jesus. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen.
Welcome once again to worship this morning. Several announcements. Uh, having begun the season of Advent, we are this year going to resume our Wednesday night gatherings um, for the next four Wednesdays. We're going to have a full four weeks this year. Um, so we'll gather. Uh, we're sort of testing out the interest in the dinner part. So if who thinks they might want to come to a midweek dinner? See a few hands. So. Um, at 6.30, we're going to have um, a meal. We'll sign up to bring the meal. We're going to space ourselves out a little bit more in the fireside room. And then at 7.15, we'll have our service of evening prayer here in the sanctuary. Instead of gathering all in the choir loft like we usually do, we'll spread out amongst the church. And that'll be at 7.15. And you're welcome to come to either or both of those. Um, please let me know if you're willing to, uh, to cook the food uh, probably it sounds like you know six to eight, maybe ten people, so not a large uh, crowd, but I know that's a very important uh, service for, for a lot of folks, me, myself included. So mark your calendars for that, and mark your calendars for Saturday, December 18th, since we can't take one of our bus trips this year, we're going to sort of make more out of our um, Christmas decorating here at the church, so instead of trying to cram it in on a Sunday morning, on Saturday the 18th at 4 p.m., we're going to have a deck the halls pre-Christmas celebration. So we will set up the tree and the garland, uh, decorate the church for Christmas. Uh, we will have um, pizza. And if you want to bring some Christmas cookies that you made at home to share, we'll have um, maybe some carols, um, you know, cider and hot cocoa. M make a sort of a, a, a special evening of it. So uh, December 18th at 4 p.m., we'd love if you could join us for that. And finally, over the next two Sundays, um, it's time to do our voting for what we would like the Mission Fund to support next year. Many of you came to two of the brainstorming sessions we had back in November. Um, there is now a list of those things. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have it in time for this morning, but in the email this week and printed next Sunday, you'll have a list of all of the proposed ideas. And then you'll, if you're here in person, you'll have those colored dots. Uh, to vote for the things that you think we should fund. If you're at home, we have an online way for you to vote as well, and that will be in your email. Um, and you'll see we actually have a church calendar again. We haven't had that for a long time, because things are starting to, to happen. So if, you, if something should be on the calendar, please let me know. Any announcements from the congregation? Oh, yes, poinsettias. 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 Uh, for the next, those are due on the... 19th. So if you want to buy a poinsettia for Christmas in honor of or in memory of someone, talk to Phil outside. Seeing no other announcements. Go in peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be to God.